Uh, Professor Amos uh, Giora, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. On October 12th, Leon Panetta, who's the former head of the CIA and now the U.S. Secretary of Defense, spoke at a meeting uh, in New York organized by business executives for national security. And he warned in that meeting that the U.S. faces a pre-9-11 moment as far as cybersecurity is concerned. He spoke about the possibility of a cyber Pearl Harbor mm. in which cyber actors could launch attacks on the country's infrastructure in conjunction with physical attacks. Uh, do you think, uh, do you agree with this assessment? Uh, and how vulnerable is the U.S. today to such a threat? And what could be its consequences? I think, first of all, that Secretary Panetta was spot on in terms of highlighting the danger posed by cybersecurity. As we were talking before we um, started the interview, I think cybersecurity has gone under the radar. And if Secretary Panetta intended to you know, make it the bold headline, Pearl Harbor, I think he was um, effective and successful in that. In terms of the threats posed by cybersecurity, I don't think there's any doubt that the dangers and risks are enormous. And if, if he intended this headline-grabbing moment, I think he was right to do that. And I think, it, I think the discussion subsequent to that has shown how important it is to have this discussion. Okay. Now, if such a cyber attack were to happen, where might it come from and who might the attackers be? Well, I think, first of all, those who are engaged in cyber terrorism are seriously smart, sophisticated people. So it's a different kind of terrorist than, say, 9-11. It requires a different skill set. It can be from within, it can be from without. And it just simply requires having a pretty sophisticated understanding of technology, of how the systems work, and ultimately how to impact them and, God forbid, how to shut them down. And whether, again, as I say, it comes from in, within or without, I don't think there's any doubt that if one thinks about down-the-road threats, that cybersecurity, cyber terrorism poses an enormous threat. But would the threat come from, say, nation states, or would they come from loose groups of uh, hackers like I, uh, Anonymous? Uh, I don't know about Anonymous, but I think it would probably come from, I would think more from non-state actors than from state actors. Um, and hackers, yes, but obviously really sophisticated hackers. Because if you think, I mean, they don't, if you think about the kinds of dangers that they pose, whether it's shutting a system down, whether shutting cities down, impacting banking systems, impacting the water flow of a, system, of a city. I mean, it just goes on and on because we are all obviously totally computer dependent. Uh, think about airplanes in the air, right? Um, it just goes on and on. And I think in that sense, the dangers are so extraordinary. And one of the things that worries me, and I think that's why it's important to have this discussion, is I'm not sure to what extent we as a society f fully and truly understand the threat posed by cybersecurity. Yeah. But depending on whether it was another nation state that was launching an attack or uh, non-state actors, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, uh, what might the defense strategy be and, and how would it differ in each of those cases? I think if it's a nation state that's engaged in a cyber attack, not cyber terrorism, because nation states don't engage in terrorism, right? It would be a cyber attack. I think that'd be equivalent to an act of war. And I think if an act of war is an act of war, and according to Article 51 of the UN Charter, that would certainly enable the attacked nation state to respond to the attacking nation state. If it's a non-state actor, then it would be in the context of counterterrorism. And the response, at least from a legal perspective as I, as I advocate, would justify the nation state responding aggressively to non-state actors who are engaged in cyber terrorism, which is yet another form of terrorism. Now, to your mind, which, is, uh, which are some of the most uh, dramatic examples of cyber terror attacks in recent times? Uh, and, and what might be some of the lessons that one could draw from the way the situation played out? I'll give you an example. I, a number of years ago, met with a senior vice president of one of America's largest banks. The bank had been infiltrated slash hacked um, by one guy who was able to wire an extraordinary amount of money after having set up approximately 400 fictitious accounts. And the kinds of money that this one guy through these 400 accounts was wiring was lots of money, all going to terrorism. So there's a direct link between cyber security, cyber terrorism, and the financing of terrorism. That is deeply troubling. And it was very clear after the conversation with his vice president that his bank, huge bank in the United States, 
was wholly unprepared and unequipped to respond to this. That for me was a sobering moment. In fact, it's, it's very interesting you mentioned that example because even in his speech, Mr. Panetta mentioned that there were some U.S. financial institutions, major institutions, that were very recently targeted for uh, cyber attacks. Can you give us a little, I mean, the, the, the kind of attack they faced was the distributed denial of service variety of attacks. Uh, could you speak a little bit about what damage such, such attacks can inflict upon the institution? Well, first of all, the fact that somebody is wiring, or first of all, setting up fictitious accounts, and then wiring hundreds of millions of dollars to terrorist organizations obviously impacts all of us. But I think maybe more than that, it shows how vulnerable the systems are. And I think if I go back to Secretary Panetta's comments about Pearl Harbor, if you go back to think about Pearl Harbor itself, how extraordinary, vulner how vulnerable the United States was in retrospect. And I think if and his using the phrase Pearl Harbor, it's like a clarion call to understand our vulnerability and to begin baby steps to more effectively protect ourselves, then to answer your question, then I think that probably is the most important service he could have provided. Now, unlike uh, ground zero in the case of a physical attack, a cyber attack doesn't leave a crater. No. Uh, and even when the private sector firms, like the banks you mentioned, have their intellectual property stolen, very often they are not even aware of the fact. Totally. Uh, how can firms get around this problem, if at all? I think the first thing that, that the private sector needs to do, and frankly also government, is to recognize that cyber terrorism, even though it doesn't leave a crater, maybe it leaves a larger crater and to more effectively begin the process of protecting themselves and their assets against some really sophisticated hacking. It probably doesn't have the uh, extraordinary appeal, right, of an attack. 9-11, the building is blowing up. It's dramatic. A cybersecurity attack is not dramatic. There's no, there's no real visual, and visuals are important. But I would think that from the perspective of the private sector, and the example I give you about this bank, if I were a CEO of an American, uh, major American financial institution, I would say to my relevant vice presidents that in many ways our vulnerability is less or no less our building than our intellectual property, our accounts, our money, and that we need to um, take a pretty serious look at how well we are protecting ourselves with the understanding that perhaps the answer is we're not protecting ourselves, and then to undertake the process, to begin the process of protecting ourselves from a cyber attack the same way we're protecting ourselves against a physical attack. Uh, now, American firms are hardly alone in, in facing these attacks. For example, there have been reports about a virus called Shamoon mm. that infected computer systems at Aramco, right. uh, the Saudi oil company. And similar attacks have also been observed against RAS gas in, in uh, a major energy producer in Qatar. Right. Uh, so al although cyber warfare can take place uh, take place anywhere in the world, sure. which countries and companies do you think are the most vulnerable uh, to such threats today? Well, if one believes the various media reports with respect to uh, cyber attacks against Iranian assets last year and the previous year, the Stutniks, then it shows that indeed, as you correctly mentioned, that both states and enterprises are vulnerable. And Iran raises obviously important questions because of the nuclear program and how to convince the Iranians not to go forward with it. And as Stutnik showed, they are vulnerable. Um, I think they probably present a pretty compelling example of a nation state engaged in an act of creating a nuclear industry that, according to some countries, poses a threat to world security, world peace. And then the question becomes, how do you convince them not to go forward? And if a, the penetration of a virus through cyber uh, is effective in dissuading them from going forward, then I would say A, it shows their vulnerability, and B, maybe that shows the effectiveness of some kind of a cyber attack. Well, I'm uh, glad you brought up Stuxnet, uh, Stuxnet because I, I was just about to ask about that. Uh, as you may know, uh, have seen recently, there was a huge uh, article in the New York Times uh, about the fact that uh, uh, that that mentioned that perhaps the U.S. and Israel had had collaborated to create that. Uh, uh, the computer worm right. with the goal of crippling the Iranian uh, nuclear facility in Natanz. Uh, now, under international law, uh, as it exists today, are such attacks by the U.S. and Israel legal? On the assumption that indeed the U.S. and, and or Israel were involved in it, right, that's going to be the assumption, then I think you can make a pretty viable argument in the context of self-defense that the introduction of this worm or virus 
would meet various standards of, of international law for the following reason. Iran has been very clear about two things. One is creating a nuclear industry, and two, a pretty clear articulation of their desire to use that, the nascent bomb, if it were to be developed, against Israel. I mean, right. And then the question becomes, how does Israel protect itself, and what are the limits of protection, protecting itself in the context of self-defense? So if there's this industry being created, a nuclear program, and these threats, then I would think that an introduction of a virus would uh, meet this test A of self-defense and B of limited self-defense. And so I think from the perspective of international law, I think that meets those tests. Okay. Now, Stuxnet was detected when it, quote, unquote, escaped uh, from Iran and found its way to the West. Uh, according to, again, to, according to the New York Times, uh, U.S. officials blamed Israel for this. But regardless of who was responsible and who's at fault, what are the chances that digital bombs like Stuxnet can fall into the wrong hands and then end up being used against the creators. Uh, is there anything that can be done to protect uh, people against That's these That's why threats? one hopes that those who create the worms or the viruses are sophisticated enough to also pr introduce firewalls to make sure that it doesn't bounce back, right? You don't have a boomerang effect, and therefore you don't have what's, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. That obviously is going to depend on, on the, the technical skills and competence of those who are creating the viruses. But there's always a risk whenever you create some kind of an aggressive mechanism, uh, if it falls into the wrong hands, you know, it can, you never know where it's going to potentially end up. Now, countries like China and Russia are said to be actively developing their cyber capabilities. Uh, now, as cyberspace becomes a war zone, is it realistic to believe that international regulations could be developed to bring about greater transparency? Uh, and given the global nature of cyberspace and competing national interests, who would oversee compliance? That's a great question. And it goes to a, a larger issue. Let's call it the, the changing nature of international law and to what extent is international law relevant to changing forms of technology and warfare. No doubt the issues you're raising here are China, Russia, cyber, 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 cyberspace. It's probably going to require various international organizations um, to be more involved in this in terms of international conventions, international treaties, regulating the use of cyber. Here we are in 2012 and the verge of 2013. I think we're a long way off from really fully understanding, A, the, the dangers posed, and B, the benefits, perhaps. And it's going to take um, uh, scholars, academics, the international community, technical people, computer experts to work together to A, understand the limits and then to create, it need, as you say, some kind of regulatory mechanisms to ensure that these new means are not used nefariously. Right. In the U.S., uh, some efforts are being made to deal with the legal issues also through initiatives such as the Cybersecurity Act of 2012, which was co-sponsored by Senators Lieberman, Collins, Rockefeller, and Feinstein. Uh, now, the legislation has bipartisan support, as far as I understand, but it has fallen victim to legislative and political gridlock. Uh, could you explain what some of the major hurdles are and what the implications will be if the act becomes law? Well, first of all, let's begin with the gridlock. There is, um, here we are on election day, right? There, there is something called politics in the United States. Um, and issues like this, even though there's bipartisan support, there's always a political end to it, a political aspect to it. A lot of it, obviously, needless to say, is related to the politics of Washington at the moment. Two, going back to how we began our conversation, I think there's still question to what extent we all understand the dangers posed. I think also there are questions in terms of who's going to be, to your question about regulatory mechanisms, and I think probably this stage, 2012, 2013, with a new Congress coming in on January 20th, I think we're unfortunately a long way away from, as I said earlier, understanding the benefits and understanding the dangers. And even there has been, even if there has been legislation introduced, I think unfortunately we're more at a beginning stage than even at a middle stage in terms of understanding this. And I think to that extent, the, the work ahead of all of us is, is extraordinarily complex, but simultaneously extraordinarily critical. I'd like to end with a hypothetical question. You could be a law professor. <laughs> what are the chances of an all-out cyber war between the East and West developing into a conventional war, and what would it take to precipitate it? 
So I don't know about war between East and West. I think you know that paradigm um, hopefully came to a crashing end in December of '89 when the wall, when the Berlin Wall came down. But I do think that that cyber terrorism, state, non-state, cyber war, state, state, um, is perhaps a more realistic option than we would like to think it is a realistic option, and certainly more than it has been had been five years ago. And I think something that, as I say earlier, said earlier, and I want to emphasize we need to be much more sensitive to and much more proactive with respect to in terms of establishing very sophisticated firewalls to protect ourselves. There's no doubt that, going back to, I like your term of the crater. The crater left, the crater, right, left by a cyber attack um, in many ways is far more dangerous than a physical crater. One, because you don't see it. There's something um, very disconcerting about that. And shutting down cities, shutting down systems, shutting down banks, the long-term ramifications of that are extraordinary. And um, again, as I said earlier, to what extent we have begun the process of adequately preparing ourselves, I think that's an open question. Uh, Professor Amos Guerra, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me.